In his new book, Plan B, Rescuing a Planet Under Stress and a Civilization in Trouble, environmentalist and thinker Lester Brown says the world needs a new plan. Plan A, the status quo of overconsuming the world's natural resources, cannot continue. What we need, writes Brown, is a major shift of our priorities towards environmental security, and we need to do it fast, at wartime speed. Earth Focus talked with Lester Brown recently to find out more about Plan B. The environmental trends that have been underway now for some decades uh, are reaching a point where they're going to be affecting the economy. Um, and, and I've noticed as I look at the global economy through an environmental lens that we in fact are now beginning to build a bubble economy one where economic output is artificially inflated by the overconsumption of natural capital. We're overpumping aquifers, we're overplowing land for crops, we're overfishing, we're overgrazing, we're overloading the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, and all these things are beginning to catch up with us in a sense. The three things I think we need to do in response to the, the conditions that are beginning to unfold are stabilize population as soon as possible, uh, uh, dramatically raise water productivity, and I think that's entirely doable, and to stabilize climate as soon as possible. When we look at population, we see that we're projected to add, um, by 2050, close to 3 billion people. What most demographers do not then point out is that the overwhelming majority of these 3 billion will come in countries where water tables are already falling and where wells are going dry. So we're, we're looking at, I think, a much more urgent need to stabilize population than most people realize. But the key to smaller families is more education for women. Simply put, the more education women have, the fewer children they have. So we should be educating girls in the third world as though our future depended on it, because indeed it may. We have an extraordinary amount of wind energy in the world. In 1991, the Department of Energy did a National Wind Resource Inventory of the United States, in which they pointed out that North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas had enough harnessable wind energy to satisfy national electricity needs. Looking back, we now know that that was a gross underestimate because it was based on the wind turbine technology of that time. And today, with the advances in, in wind turbine design, we can harness wind at lower wind speeds, we can convert wind to, into electricity much more efficiently, and we can um, uh, harvest wind at a much higher elevation. The, the turbines of 1991 were maybe 120 feet tall. The ones being put in today are 300 feet tall. So we've suddenly multiplied the amount of energy. And the bottom line is that we can, uh, using wind alone, if we decided we wanted to, we could satisfy not only all electricity needs, but all energy needs. Once you get cheap electricity, then you can electrolyze water and produce hydrogen. Hydrogen is not only the fuel of choice for fuel cell engines, but you can use it in internal combustion engines. Every service station in the United States, all 160,000 of them, have the two things required to make hydrogen. They have water and they have electricity. The only other thing they need is a, is a compressor because hydrogen gas is voluminous. You have to compress it to, to get it down to a density that you can put into a car and drive the car 300 miles, for example. So I think, I think this is entirely doable and I think technology will play a role, but the overriding uh, concern is priorities and, and political leadership. And uh, there is opposition to uh, these things today, but there was opposition to the U.S. going into World War II on December 6, 1941. I have gone back and read some of the economic history of World War II because I wanted to get a sense of, of how one could restructure an economy quickly if one wanted to do that to stabilize climate, for example. And I, among other things, I read President Roosevelt's State of the Union address on January 6, 1942, one month after Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt laid out the goals. He said, 
We are going to produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, 20,000 artillery guns, and 6 million tons of ocean shipping. I mean, we were suddenly faced with, an, with, the, with the need to fight two major wars on the far side of, of two oceans. So the logistics were extraordinarily challenging. Our task is unprecedented and the time is short. We must strain every existing armament producing facility to the utmost. We must convert every available plant and tool to war production. That goes all the way from the greatest plants to the smallest, from the huge automobile industry to the village machine shop. He and his colleagues had realized that at that time, the largest concentration of industrial power in the world was in the U.S. automobile industry. Because even during the Depression, we were producing three or four million cars a year. So after his State of the Union address, he met with the leaders in the automobile industry and said, you know, we're going to depend heavily on you guys to, to, to build these weapons. And they said, well, it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, because making all these cars and these weapons is, is a bit of a stretch for us. He said, you don't understand. We're going to ban the sale of private automobiles in the United States. And the, and the automobile industry became fully involved in manufa manufacturing tanks and planes and, and, and guns and so forth. So it was an extraordinary restructuring and it happened in less than a year. This production of ours in the United States must be raised far above present levels, even though it will mean the dislocation of the lives and occupations of millions of our own people. We must raise our sights all along the production line. Let no man say it cannot be done. It must be done, and we have undertaken to do it. Ever since September 11, 2001, political leaders around the world and the media have been preoccupied with terrorism. And it's, it's an important challenge, no question about that. But if Osama bin Laden and his colleagues succeed in diverting our attention from the environmental trends that are undermining our future, like rising temperatures and falling water tables, they will, in the end, succeed beyond their wildest expectations. And so what I think we need to do is to recognize what the real threats to our future are, to not only to us, but the entire world. And, and those threats are primarily environmental.